good evening. Good evening. So Hello, good sir. Hello, good morning. Good Where morning. Uh, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, would you mind just giving a little intro, tell us who you are and what you do? Okay, well, I'm, I'm sort of at the other end of uh, the InfoSec side. Uh, I'm focusing on the embedded security side. Um, so I work for a, a semiconductor manufacturer, and uh, I'm sort of looking at side channel analysis and fault injection and, and that sort of end of things. But there's a lot of commonality in terms of developers needing to be aware of these sorts of risks um, and these things not being taught. So yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that are quite common. Whether you're talking about the the application security level or uh, security at the the lowest levels. So in your case, I guess you work on hardware and devices and things per perhaps people have in their homes or in their businesses. What yeah, I mean, we we sell chips. Our customers use them for various things, but it's um, predominantly. Uh, automotive and industrial and IoT devices. Um, so yeah, there's we have a, a large range of customer requirements for, for different products. Um, and to a certain extent, that means that we are uh, we have to try and help the customers maintain the security. And different customers have different uh, opinions of what they need. So that yeah, there's there's quite a big difference. So I, I sort of got into this from uh, a embedded software engineering background, um, so sort of physics degree, and then to uh, the software for about ten years, um, Very and then cool. I I got into the security side of things through podcasts originally, um, and then I moved to our smart car group and um, spent some time writing secure bootloaders and um, uh, specking systems for uh, smart metering, that sort of thing. Um, and then I decided to make it a bit more formal and do a, a master's in information security. So that's that's kind of how I got into InfoSec. Um, so you're, you're probably the, the most qualified person in the room then, I guess. I doubt that very much. I, I've definitely <laughs> got imposter syndrome here because you've got uh, some incredible guests and me. Nah, so, you're so, so I, I want to ask a question, though, because we hear in the media and in the InfoSec press about, you know, Internet of Things security and, and how, you know, vulnerable things are, et cetera, et cetera. From your perspective, uh, are things getting better? Are, are, the, are your efforts sort of coming to fruition in a more secure base hardware level? You mentioned yeah, think... secure bootloader. Is that a, really a thing now? So uh, most of the secure bootloaders are on the higher end devices. So this is the issue that um, security costs money. And uh, if you're selling, you know, uh, very cheap devices, then people don't care about how what the security is like. And so if you if you make a chip that has all the the bells and whistles that you need for security, uh, that's that's great. But if no one's going to buy it, that's that's not going to fly. So yeah, that, it's it's a hard problem to solve. Um, but yeah, certainly uh, we're definitely seeing moves in the right direction. So more of the lower end customers are definitely looking for security um, and, and willing to spend, you know, invest time and money in, in making things right. Um, standards are helping in that regard. Uh, unfortunately, there's that's the thing about standards. There's so many to choose from. Mm. <laughs> so there's a lot of competing standards in the in the IoT side even. Um, so ARM have their own uh, ARM PSA, uh, the CESIP. Um, there's there's a lot of different standards which could possibly make a difference, but it, with with so many to choose from, no one's sort of backing any one horse really at the moment. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because uh, Mikko Huppinen uh, came out with Mikko's law, which he kind of <laughs> yes. but he prescribed it himself, which was. I think along the lines of when anything is con uh, described as smart, it's vulnerable by definition. That's, sounds and, like a good rule of thumb. Yeah, and and it makes sense. And I find, and you know, I've been to a lot of talks in the UK in the past couple of years, and you've seen like the guys at Pentest Partners that have been hacking sex toys and ships and uh, yeah. CCTV yeah. systems and basically anything that's got a chip in it. And in any kind of level of intelligence. And going back to your point about making it cheap, 
and then forsaking security. You don't need to see too many kind of butt plugs and dildos that have caused damage and harm to an individual because they got hacked or cloud pets. The thing that Troy Hunt goes on about quite a lot um, where your kids information and and the videos of your children, audio recordings of your children are online in buckets that can be hacked and all that kind of stuff. How much more of that does it take before manufacturers are actually seriously forced into doing the right thing? And stopping cost being the issue and starting putting security first? So I I think there's some things that could change. Uh, Currently, how does a consumer know which products are secure? So if if you say, let's go and buy something from any big retailer online, for example, uh, there's there's nothing there that uh, allows a, a consumer to have that that knowledge of whether this is a, a decent bit of kit or yeah. something rubbish. So there's there's some movement towards standardization. Um, I think that if if we get uh, an influential retailer saying, no, before you're allowed to sell your kit on here, um, we need you to jump through some hoops. Um, like they're doing that in the state of California, right? Where there's going to be an IoT minimum requirement change default yeah. password yeah i mean there's there's a lot of these sort of moves afoot but um it's it's still all in the planning stages in a lot of places at the moment mm-hmm. um i i, I can see uh, there's what? there's somewhere it, the, the barrier to entry is quite low so the very first level is um self-certification so they just have to pay a, a, a nominal fee uh, quite quite low figures and fill out a questionnaire that mm-hmm. basically ticks boxes that says yes we've considered xyz you know all the all the standard sort of things uh, and that we you know we're not we don't have shared passwords that could lead to a, a class break scenario uh, all those sorts of things and then that allows them to use the, you know, a level one logo on the on the retail side so yeah. you, you could have a, a set of traffic light system yeah. like you get with energy efficiency but for security but what do you what about the argument that there's plenty of uh, compensating controls in a properly implemented uh, IoT environment. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Simple IP tables or firewall rule that says the device is allowed to send data to a particular IP address um, end of. But yet, when we talk about the vulnerability of the device, we're making the assumption that we're just putting this thing directly on the internet with no compensating controls whatsoever, um, not, you know, going through the process of changing default passwords. Like at some point, the manufacturers must be pretty frustrated that the threat model is like this thing alone, no infrastructure, no monitoring, no logging, you know, just sitting out there. Yeah, that's that's a problem that I don't think is going to be solved for the IoT sort of side of things because uh, I, unless you're going to explain how to configure the firewall to my dad um, <laughs> yeah okay I, I, I think that that so, problem is going to remain but i mean on the on the industrial puts, side and automotive who, it's different yeah. but who puts a dvr or ip tv cameras directly on the internet rather than segmenting them off and locking that down in an enterprise scenario i am i going to yeah, be surprised but, by the amount of people that actually just fling it out there and put it on the wi-fi and call it a day uh, it, it, I guess a lot of that, uh, particularly with the CCTV type systems and uh, DVRs, um, it depends on who your installer is as well, um, yeah. whether they've uh, increasingly, uh, these devices are now coming with their own uh, you know, sort of 4G access that maybe bypasses some of those controls. Yeah. I, I also want to ask, like, how do we get consumers to follow basic security advice? So. Home Moot has been a, a, a really good example. You, you get one out of the box, they have a default password, uh, especially with the, the wi- wireless, uh, changing the, the password associated with your wireless and even changing the SSID. It's not too difficult. I'm sure many people will be able to do it with a set of right instructions. And doing that means you're going to immediately raise that bar significant enough that attackers are probably just going to lose interest and go elsewhere. So how do we get messages like that to non-technical people. Like, as soon as you buy this and plug it in, do this. 
Yeah, well, some, some of that can be uh, mitigated by making sure that, for example, in the devices you have unique IDs, so they can be used for uh, key derivations, so you can have, um, you, know, you don't need the consumer to do that, they, they just read it off the, the card that comes in the box that this is what their password is, and that's unique to them, uh, it's, it's not a default password for all devices, for example. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, most of most of the work I do is is not on the IoT side. So we're sort of trying to test the security of our devices. Uh, so we have um, yeah, crypto accelerators and things. Um, mm -hmm. So it, in those sort of scenarios, you're, you're looking to see if you can recover the key. So, um, so I'm sort of using uh, electromagnetic emissions from the chip whilst it's encrypting to to try and. Uh, to see if, if we can recover the key from the device and then yeah, testing the countermeasures that that prevent that sort of thing from happening. That sounds good. So can I ask you a question about around um, disclosure? So yeah, sure. it might not be something that you, you get directly involved in, but we do see um, hardware vendors producing equipment, BitFi being an example. That's the only <laughs> time I'm going to mention it. But <laughs> Or the that, third time this evening. Oh, was it the third time? Yeah. Yeah. I'm making no unhackable claims here. Right. Very, very <coughs> right. But that product did exist, and it came with a set of claims. Um, but the question really is around disclosure. So on the one hand, you get manufacturers that will go, yeah, okay, we said it was this, and it isn't, and thank you for your feedback, and we're going to fix it, and we'll deal with it. There is an example. Sorry to use another sex toy, but Cockcam did that, okay? Um, and then, on the other hand, you get the other company that I'm not going to mention again that say, no, our product is completely unhackable, and we defy you to do something about it. What's the right approach? And How do you think vendors should really be responding to this kind of stuff when the community reacts really quickly and says, no, you're wrong, and here's why. You know, what, what's the right approach if there, so, aren't, if there aren't currently any standards? Um, uh, in terms of standards, well, yeah, the PISA um, kind of is uh, a useful guidance there. Um, it, basically, people have got to not shoot the messenger. I mean, I'm, I, I have handled uh, security disclosures myself um, and reporting that up the chain to the management results in some, um, you know, well, who is this person? Why are they attacking our device type questions? Sure. It's like, no, that's, that's the wrong attitude. We, we need to, you know, make sure that we understand the problem, understand, the, you know, what needs to be done to resolve it and who we need to tell about it. So it, it, it's something that needs to change in the organisation that's producing the, whatever it is, whether it's the hardware uh, the, the product, whatever level of uh, security disclosure you're talking about. Yeah. Um, the biggest issue I, I think that I face with these sorts of things is uh, where th progress uh, moves on, so people's expectations change. And yeah, well, when that device was released, there was no expectation. This was outside of the threat model. Um, but you know, clearly, equipment to hack things gets cheaper and easier to obtain uh, more people can can do things more capably with less money um, and so suddenly these things become a, a more distinct possibility and even though it wasn't in the original um, you know, remit of protection for this type of device it, it still looks bad if if you're vulnerable to it yeah yeah so, so kind of adding to that um, so one thing we see quite often is, hey, we found this vulnerability, and the vendor's immediate reaction is, oh, that's our device, we no longer support it, so we're not going to fix this. It's um, a problem, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so what are your thoughts? Like, should there be a minimum time period that vendors will have to adhere and support to? And if so, what should that be? So I want to make a point that eventually, like 10 or 12 years later, after the SSL standard changes, what? you can't log into it anymore. <laughs> well, well, just to be clear, like some of these devices that are still on their side saying, hey, click here to buy it off Amazon. Yeah. yeah. I, I, know, I don't think you've invited Dave Wine on, have you? For, <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, the invite to join was open. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, yeah, I mean, these these are going to be problems. You know, how long does a company have to support a product for? Uh, particularly if if things have moved on and they have products which have greater levels of security. And so I think ultimately there's probably going to be some form of you know uh, EU regulations or whatever wherever you are in the world. There's, at some point the, the laws will catch up. Consumer laws, um, but that's very consumer. And what happens with you know business to business and um, yeah, there's, there's various issues with that. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's not a problem I, I can say I have an answer to. Yeah. I think in conclusion, with certainly in the enterprise, you can pick a, a provider, whether it's DVR, IP, to, um, IP cameras and all that kind of stuff. I know it's not your neck of the woods per se, but there are things and decisions that you can make yourself that kind of limit your risk of compromise. So if you are doing a CCTV system in your company, then I don't know, segment the network away yeah you don't make your cameras easily innumerable for example um and do stuff like that so i guess the point i'm making here is that you it's not entirely incumbent on a vendor to do the right things there are also decisions yeah. and controls yes. that you can put in place and, and yeah. adopt that, that help yourself i i the the iot security foundation has some really good um, guidance, free free downloads, white papers, uh, frameworks and things that um, IoT vendors can use, um, which if, if they were to follow those recommendations, then I think a lot of these problems would be mitigated. Uh, uh, so shout I, out to those guys. Yeah, I, I, I guess where my point was trying to also go is like sometimes I view the vendors actually using, oh, well, we're not going to fix it because it's EOL and that's an excuse rather than investing the time and effort to fix it. Um, I, I, I mean, what does a consumer do when the business is no longer trading or um, yeah. you know, they, they, that, that's it's too, acquisitions yeah. later, it's a different company? Yeah, that, that's it, it's always going to remain as a problem. Yeah. But um, I, so, I mean, I'm looking at the very lowest levels of, of chips, <laughs> um, sort of trying to, trying to break them. Um, and a lot of it is also things like um, trying to... Uh, break flash reprotection and those sorts of things and these sort of fault injection attacks where it, you've got perfect code, bug free, but you can induce a fault that causes the code to be vulnerable. So, you know, if you can, it, it's all very well having a, you know, hardware root of trust and doing your secure boot and checking the signature. But if you can bypass that if else check, you know, did the signature match or not, did the hash match, um, then uh, that's that's another way of, of bypassing these things. Yeah, so absolutely. I think from from a from a uh, our customer's point of view, uh, or you know someone writing code for a device, you should always assume that your code will be read at some point and understood. With things like Ghidra making that a lot easier these days. So don't rely on the security by obscurity. Don't don't have your your cloud API keys such that. Um, you know, they can be uh, someone can attack one device and you know, get your API key and uh, make mischief on online. Yeah, surge words. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> agree with that. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I feel a bit shit calling you Bast. You, I'd really like to know what your real name is, but anyway, <laughs> oh, I'm sad. That's entirely up to you. Uh, what are you going to be doing in the next year? Give us a flavour of some of the work that you're going to be looking at. I, I think a lot of what I'm going to be doing is trying to um, bridge the gap between the, the security group and the, the yeah, hardware design and the um, application side. Um, so a lot of that's going to be education within my company. And um, uh, there's a lot of standard stuff going on at the moment. There's uh, automotive standards, ISO 21434 is coming out, which is uh, which we're somewhat involved in. Um, and uh, that's going to force uh, at least consideration of some of these more sort of physical attacks um, in the automotive sphere. So there's a lot of uh, process and procedure stuff to kind of marry up the automotive and the industrial uh, ISO standards. Um, so yeah, I think uh, as well as device evaluations. Um, so yeah, looking to break more devices and get them fixed before they go out the door. Cool. Make sure that um, uh, design is is good, so I'm, I'm getting more and more involved in the uh, architecture, the higher up the the chain of designs so earlier in the process. Brilliant, that sounds fascinating. Again, somebody else doing a job that's far more interesting than the one I do. 
Um, but thank you very much indeed for your time. Really, really good stuff. Thanks very much. Yeah, nice one. Thanks a lot, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Thanks.